This event is really important to us because if we, if we think back over the last year and we look at the so many different things that have been going on, whether it's on the global stage, whether it's here domestically, I mean, even KFC ran out of chicken, right? So that's how bad the world has got. To. But when we look at what's happening with Russia, what's happening with Mr. Trump, um, all of the geopolitics that's changing around us, all of our anxieties around Brexit. And we've seen the terrible, the tragedy of Grenfell Tower, terror attacks, so many things that are there on our landscape, some quite far away, some right on our backyard, in our backyard. And all of these things challenge us, all of these things make us, provoke us and they make us think about our lives and what it means to be Muslim and what it means to be a citizen of this country and to live in our society. One of the things that's really affected me deeply and touched me is this, is how sector after sector after sector we've seen this unveiling of a travesty of the way in which women have been treated in our society. And that's not something that's only at the macro level. It's happening also within Muslim circles. We've heard of uh, events and personalities that have been implicated within the Muslim sphere as well. So it's not just something that's over there. It's not something that's just happening in amongst politicians and now most recently with the charitable sector. It's even with Muslim scholars and thinkers that I think so many of us over the years had put trust and, and, and vested energy into um, reading and following and thinking about. So all of these things, they challenge us, they make us think, they, they, they often provide a lot of pain and anguish in our lives. And I, and I guess the message that we bring to that scene and the constant message that we're trying to put forward in the midst of all of this, big or small challenges, is that we need to step back from these things and not be defined by the pain and the anger and the difficulties that we see around us. Because a religion, if it is to provide anything for mankind, for human beings, is a better way, is a higher path, is a, is a, is a path of greater moral guidance. A religion should allow us to rise above the pain that we feel and not be defined by the pain that is in, right in front of us. Because if we are consumed by it to the extent that we become defined by it, and all of our reactions only become shaped by that pain and that anger, then we actually become a part of the problem. We no longer hold the moral agency to provide a solution. And that's something I think we need to think about. And it's, it's in this context, I think, that we, we talk about reform, we talk about ways in which we need to think about Islam in a different way. And that's nothing new. That's nothing new because we would say that when the Prophet himself came, he was an agent of reform. He was someone who came with a critical voice to society to say things are not as they should be, we need to change things and that's all that reform means. If you go back to its Arabic wording, the term islah means to make whole, to bring something back to its wholeness. So we're not saying that something, our agenda isn't about changing Islam to fit the environment, as sometimes people often um, uh, criticize such movements, and not just ours, but many others. It's to say that there is something wrong, and unless we take a different approach, doing the same things again and again and again is not a viable option. And I want to say three things before I leave and hand over to our, uh, to our keynote speakers. One is that, the first thing is that the Quran tells us that God will not change the situation of a people until they begin to change what is in themselves. And I think this is the vision that the Qur'an often puts out to us and the challenge that the Qur'an puts out to us 
that yes, you want to see society made better. Yes, yes, you want to see things different. Yes, you want there to be change. But you are a part of that society that you're critiquing. And unless you start with yourself, unless you're able to change at least the things that you have dominion over, that you have power over, I may not be able to control Donald Trump's tweets, but I can control my own tweets. And unless on that very small scale I can change my own behavior, then I have no hope of changing all the big things around me. So starting with ourselves. The second thing is that our challenge to our community is that Islam, Islam for us is, a, is, a, is an ever-flowing, fresh spring. But in order for it to retain its freshness, it needs to keep speaking to us. And we need to keep listening to it. So not just the voice of Islam 500 years ago, or 1,000 years ago, or 200 years ago, or even 50 years ago, even 10 years ago. But it's a well that we need to keep going back to and drawing from so that we're able to have a fresh, a, a fresh take on that religion, on that eternally valuable and valid religion. And that's the challenge, I think, of reformers to our societies, that we need to keep reading Islam, keep interpreting Islam, because a religion is nothing but human interpretation. And so we need to keep going back to our interpretations and asking questions. As the environment changes, becomes more complex, adapts, we also need to go back and interrogate it further and further. And the third point I'd like to make, that when you look at the diversity that we have in this program, when you look at the people sitting in this room, the challenge for us is so great that us Muslims shrinking into a bubble and thinking about Islam just for ourselves, amongst ourselves, with ourselves, is no longer a tenable way forward. The challenges are so great. Maybe they have always been thus. But we need to open up our doors and ensure that this conversation on Islam is something that everybody has a stake in. Believers, non-believers, Muslims, people who are not of the Muslim faith, people who are, who are practicing Muslims, people who might call themselves ex-Muslims, people of different religions, people of no religion, Muslims of all different shapes and hues and approaches. The table has to be open for all of these people to come together to bring their ideas to the table. We, we had a bit of media coverage around this event and people were asking us, why do you have ex-Muslims speaking at this event? And I said, surely as someone who's grown up in a Muslim family and then has decided not to follow the religion of Islam, surely that is the very voice we need to be listening to today in order to learn about where things have gone wrong. If we, if we ignore those voices, if we cut out the voices that we may not like to hear, then we lose. And we've, we've already lost before we begin the fight. So, our, so these are the three points that I'd like to make. Firstly, we start with ourselves. Secondly, that we need to think of Islam as an ever-flowing spring that we need to keep going back to and keep, inter keep interpreting and not be satisfied with interpretations of 300 years old uh, ago or, or even 50 years ago. And thirdly, that this process has to be an inclusive process where we're not just for Muslims by Muslims, but it's about the whole family, the whole human family being able to come together and talk about Islam. And I think that's why when the Quran addresses its readers, it addresses humanity. It doesn't always address Muslims. In fact, it only addresses Muslims a fraction of the time. A lot of its discourse is, Ya ayyuhan nas, O oh, people, mankind. Because it sees everybody as, its, as, 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 as the audience that it's in conversation with. So, yeah, this may not be everybody's cup of tea, but this is our cup of tea. And we have every right to make our tea as we, as, as, as we wish. Um, so with those words, I'd like to thank you.
uh, for being here. I look forward to two days of really interesting ex and exciting topics and conversations uh, and discussions.